I want to say thank you to Alan and Lisa for organizing this. Um, I had spoken with them earlier this fall and had asked if I could give a talk. I do this often with running groups and skiing groups. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute, why I enjoy trying to um, empower and teach people how their body moves when they're doing their sport or just whatever their daily movement pattern is. And I find that there's a huge gap in education. And so people don't really know how to pay attention to how they're moving. And so then they aren't able to kind of like self manage themselves. So I'll get into it more, but um, my name is Hillary McCloy. I live in Jackson and I um, am a physical therapist primarily. Um, and I actually just opened a, my own physical therapy business here in Jackson in the old gallery on the corner, but now the Ski the Whites building. So I'm excited to be up in this area and right outside from the Jackson Ski Touring. So um, my background is I grew up um, downhill ski racing. And so that was my passion. I was on the US ski team for five years. I raced in college and then all of those experiences pushed me towards being interested in the body. And I went to physical therapy school out in California. And then six years ago, right after I graduated, so almost seven years ago, I'm, we, Andrew, my partner, Drummond, and I moved back to the Valley. I, I've lived in Vermont and New Hampshire, but um, Andrew's from Conway. Many of you probably know the Drummonds. Um, and that's where I started to really get interested in, um, um, I started doing more backcountry skiing and running. And it was interesting how those blended with my physical therapy as I, sort of to, started to um, progress my, my practice. And I found that I really enjoyed working with people that are active. You know, you don't have to be just an athlete, but anyone who's interested in their body and how they move. And I found that there's a really big gap in understanding about our body um, and, and how our body moves and why it moves. And that is often a, can be um, sort of a cause of why people can get injured. And so, just giving pretty simple um, explanations on biomechanics, which is just basically how our body's moving in space, the importance of muscles and what they do in our body, and as well as all the movement patterns, um, people can really become empowered and get some autonomy in, in kind of self-care and understanding more about their body. I have so many people that come in um, to PT who, whether they were injured or repetitive use, but they're, they're hurt, and I feel like you know, as a physical therapist, I think that, you know, we have the skills to work with people um, all the time, not just when you're hurt, because when you come in and you're hurt, we're sort of fighting and we're going to swimming back upstream to try to um, kind of fix the issue. And maybe it was an injury and, you know, something traumatic, but if it was an overuse injury, then, um, you know, often with just a little bit of understanding, you'd be able to, um, Sorry, someone's trying to direct message me, getting distracted. Um, you'd be able to understand how you're moving, then you'd be able to self really help yourself. So that's basically, as a physical therapist, I've started to um, start doing this a lot with runners and skiers, but really anyone who ha maybe has a repetitive movement at work or they sit all day at work, so postural, and, and really filling that gap with some simple education. Um, so I am not a expert Nordic skier at, at all. Um, I do have skate skis and I started skate skiing when we first moved back here and I only get out a few times a year. I primarily, if I have time and there's snow, I go backcountry skiing, I go skinning. Um, but I've enjoyed it and it's an excellent workout. And so tonight I'm definitely not going to be going over technique. I'm more just sort of breaking down the movements that are happening in our body. When, we're, when you're Nordic skiing. So I'm sure all of, there are many of you here who I know are the technique experts. So we'll have to bump into each other this, this winter on the trails. Um, so, and I've enjoyed watching Nordic skiing my whole life. I know probably all of you. I got chills when Jesse Diggins, those guys won the gold medal. So anyway, I, I enjoy it and it's a great sport. And everyone I know who is a part of a Nordic community is just, so they just love it. I think it's a sport you can do for a long time. And so it gets you outside and in the winter. So 
that's why I'm getting more interested in Nordic skiing. Um, so anyway, the whole, this evening, what I wanna do is really first talk about, break down the biomechanics, like I've said, of each classic movement pattern and then the skate movement pattern and go through each region of the body and talk about what are the primary muscle movers and what joints are moving and how they have to move in order to be more efficient. Um, if you're able to strengthen the correct muscles as well as have great mobility in certain joints, you're gonna actually be able to probably be much more efficient um, in your skiing as well as have, um, if you have more body awareness and are engaging the right muscles, you'll most likely help protect yourself against um, any kind of repetitive use injury. And then what I wanna do is go through, I've I found a few um, exercises that I've learned over the last few years that I think are great. They're definitely not your classic um, strength and conditioning exercises for Nordic skiing. They're a little bit different and I'll explain as you go through. So I wanted to add maybe some new exercises to your repertoire. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll demonstrate them. And I was thinking, and I am recording this, but I was thinking if you, um, I've done some of these Zoom classes this summer for continuing education and I used my phone and I videoed the exercise um, while the person was demonstrating it. So that's a pretty easy way to have um, some take home, you know, so instead so you have to write it down and you'll be able to remember it. So you'll be able to see that on the phone. So I suggest that, um, like I said, um, keep the mics muted. And then if you have questions, put them in the chat. And then if we have time at the end, I was gonna try to get wrap up around eight. Um, we can have some um, questions here. All right, so I did a little research on stats just because I didn't know what they were off the top of my head. But in general, Nordic skiing is a relatively, um, there aren't a ton of injuries, which is actually great. Um, and the over, overall, it's a low injury rate. And I think that's a lot to do with the fact that it's not an impact sport. Um, you're sliding and gliding, but it is very repetitive. And so if you're um, using a muscle, usually if it's like, it's probably gonna be like a tensional injury where you're getting like too much mechanical stress into tension, which is usually some kind of like overstretch or overuse versus like a compressive injury, which you're gonna get more with like running, maybe skiing. Um, and then there's usually the other type of most common cause of injury of a, of a tissue is torsional stress. And you might get a little bit of that um, in the knee and maybe in the ankle, possibly in the spine, but I, I have a feeling most of the injuries are caused are more of like a tension, um, tension issue through tendons and things. Um, and so, before we get into the classic skate pattern, I wanna just talk about muscles in general. Muscles are awesome, as we all know, because they get us to move, to get around. Um, I like to think of muscles in two different groups. Um, you have big global movers, and then you have deep stabilizing muscles. So your big global movers are the ones you can see, they're superficial. So you know, they're your quad muscles, your thighs, the front of your thighs, the back of your thighs, um, your six pack, your pec muscles, your traps, like they're, they're the ones that are like move us, you know? And so they, um, your calf muscles, they're the ones that um, get a lot of exercise in our everyday activity and sport. So often those don't need a lot of specific strengthening, um, so to speak, because you are actually using them when you're walking up the stairs and, and Nordic skiing. Um, the deep stabilizing muscles, on the other hand, are often the ones that get missed with um, any kind of training. And they're the ones that are really important for protecting our joints and giving us good motor control and stability. So examples of those are um, like in the shoulder, they're your rotator cuff muscles. They're deep, they're little, they're, they're packed right along your shoulder blade. And those don't often get um, specifically strengthened when say like you're pulling, um, you know, a lot of them do rotational motion, but they're really important to have strong because they're going to hold your, your humerus, your arm bone in the joint and protect the joint. So you need to have your big movers, your delt and your lats and everything. Um, I'm going to let somebody else in. You need to have your big movers strong and functioning well, but also your stabilizers. So in your core, in your abdominals, that's like your deeper abdominal muscles. So 
There's a muscle called your transverse abdominis that's really deep, your obliques, um, and then some of the deep back muscles that run along your spine. So, and then in your hips, those are gonna be all the muscles on the side of your hips. So your gluteus medius, that's people often talk about that one, your piriformis. And those are the ones that are really important for keeping our pelvis level and stable because they're the ones that essentially hold the femur in your socket. And so Nordic skiing is a lot of, you know, you're moving your hips a lot. There's a lot of movement going through there. And so, you know, you're moving in this plane a lot. And so those muscles are getting strong, your quads, your hip flexors, but those other muscles on the side are really important for stabilizing, but they might not be actually getting engaged that much or specifically when you're out doing the sport. So we'll talk a lot about that as we go through. And then um, I'll highlight it as we get into the exercises, because those are the ones that we often want to target. Um, but really, you know, our muscles are what keep us moving. And, and I think if you think of them as how they work for us, then you'll kind of understand them better. So they stabilize us, they move us, and they protect our joints. And then, <clears throat> so let's get into the classic motion. Um, it's essentially, it's very similar to walking and running. Um, it's reciprocal, you know, you're moving your arms and your legs. But the only difference is you have a pole. So at the end of your long arm, you have like, if you're pulling here, you're gonna have a lot of torque through the shoulder and into the body. And so because you're holding a pole, you have to think about it sort of, to me, it then like connects you to the lower body. And so they have to work together, um, especially for power and efficiency. And again, I'll <clears throat> get back to that in a minute, but I wanted to break, break up each of the skiing patterns into body areas. So we're gonna start at the feet. Very a common, common injuries for Nordic skiing in the feet, I think are in the lower leg are Achilles injuries. I don't know if you guys have any, had any strain through your calf muscle and into the Achilles. And then also um, a lot of shin splints. I don't know if you felt that, any kind of stress through your shin when you're, when you're Nordic skiing. I know <clears throat> every time I've gone Nordic skiing, I, have, oh, I often get a lot of shin tenderness in those muscles just because the movement pattern and being in the boot puts a lot of um, just like different force through the anterior muscle. That's the muscle that flexes your feet versus the muscles in the back of your legs are the ones that point your feet. And so every time you pull your foot through or slide your foot sort of forward on the ground, you're gonna get a lot of that anterior tib um, strain. And so um, that, and then for a few other reasons, if the anterior tib, the muscle in front of your shin can get overworked when your, your dorsiflexion, which is the bending of your ankle forward is limited. And you need to have good mobility in your ankle to be able to um, get, you know, use your feet correctly and you know, like kind of like toe off as you, um, as the ski leaves the ground behind you. And then as you pull your foot forward for it to hit the ground. So you need a lot of mobility in your ankles because, and that's gonna allow your muscles to, to work more efficiently. Um, your big toe is really important <clears throat> for a few reasons. If you're skiing classic, the boots are, rigid enough that there isn't a lot of, um, a ton of flex through the foot, like a running shoe, but you need to have mobility in your first toe. It needs to be able to extend. And then also your big toe flexor muscle is really, really important for when you push off on your toes. It's, it's a tiny muscle and it actually, the actual muscle belly for your big toe flexor, which is the one on, that runs on the bottom of your toe is in your, the back of your lower leg. And then it's just a big long tendon that runs under your foot and flexes it. And it's actually like a big power muscle for how much um, muscle area it has. It's actually really strong. And it also supports our medial arch. And so, and as well as our plantar fascia. So all of those things are really an important makeup of the foot. And since you're pushing off a lot when you're Nordic skiing, you need to have good power and strength in your foot and then also in your calf, and that's gonna give you more efficiency and more power as you're, as you're Nordic skiing. Um, I don't know if people have had plantar fascia issues. I think that really varies on just people's makeup and their boots and the right fit. But I know sometimes when your feet are overworking, you're, you can get some soreness in that plantar fascia. And so strengthening your first toe 
can help with that because that supports the arch and doing some exercises for that. <clears throat> So that's kind of your lower, your, your foot when you're classic skiing, kind of like, it's kind of like running. Um, and then in your looking at like the hip, glute and low back area, those are all very intertwined. Um, I know there's some back pain that you see with, I heard, I've worked with some patients who Nordic ski who have back pain and just doing some research, that's a pretty common injury, back pain. And I, I think it must come from a few different reasons. So, when you're, um, I'll sh show you, when you're um, skiing and your leg comes like, comes back, that's called hip extension. And you need to have enough hip extension um, or else when your leg comes back, your, your low back is gonna compensate. So if I didn't have enough hip extension, something has to extend and it's often the low back. And so just right there, that's just about mobility. So having good hip mobility, so hip extension is an important joint to have good mobility, same as the ankle, like we we're talking about. And so that can cause extension stress. And then also, if you watch people skiing by you and they're pulling, there is often a like flexed posture where people are bent over a little bit. And I think sometimes that is technique, but if you're always a little bent forward, then your back muscles are taking on like all the load against gravity. So they'll get a little tighter and overworked. And so you have to be careful, careful there. Um, and then our glute muscle. So we've got many, three big glute muscles. So gluteus maximus is our biggest butt muscle essentially. And that's the one that extends the hip. So when you're like sliding that foot back, you should be sort of engaging your glute and kind of like powering yourself forward. And that has to be able to engage when you're kicking back. But you also have glute med, gluteus medius, which is more on the outside of the hip. And that's, I think of one of those more stabilizing muscles. And so if you're, if you're not necessarily ignoring scene, but if you're standing and I stand on, um, if I were to stand on one leg like this, you can't see I picked my foot up off the ground. The hip muscles are keeping me pelt, like my pelvis level because they're on the side. They're attaching my femur to my pelvis and they're not letting my hip drop or drop over like this. So they're really important to keep my pelvis stable and in the correct position. And so those are more of those deep stabilizing muscles that you often have to specifically strengthen because they're maybe not getting engaged as much when you're skiing or they might, they're actually probably turning on, but you have to do like specific strengthening also. Um, and so that's where you get back more up into the back and the core, there's a lot going on. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna move further up the body for a second because it'll make more sense in a minute. We have our shoulders. So our shoulder girdle is basically our, our humerus, which is our arm bone, our shoulder joint, and then our um, shoulder blade. So the shoulder blade is actually the cup, or the, sorry, it's a ball. So we have ball and socket for our shoulder joint. And the shoulder blade is the ball part, but it's a very shallow, shallow surface. It's basically like a golf ball and a golf tee. And so you have to have stability in order for everything to work through the shoulder and your shoulder girdle, um, is, sorry, I'm getting distracted by questions. I need to, I'll look at those at the end. Um, the, shoulder, um, the shoulder blade is basically like our support. It's like the base of the shoulder. And so when we reach our arms up overhead, the whole shoulder blade moves up. And so you have to have a lot of strength in the back of the shoulder blade or else you're gonna get like rounding. Um, and then you're just in a much less, um, you're not as, like a strong of a position. So getting those shoulder blades back and down doing some upper back exercises are really good for setting the shoulders. Um, but really the, the big movers for Nordic skiing are your lats, cause they're gonna, they're gonna help with that pulling motion. Your triceps, those extend. So you're gonna get a lot of work through the triceps and then your rotator cuff muscles, cause they're the ones that are like holding everything together. But what I think is the big, most important part about thinking about like the shoulder and like in your hips and your pelvis is how they connect. And that is where 
um, you can really lose or gain a lot of power and efficiency because if you're polling, whether you're polling, you know, in a reciprocal way or double polling, as you push through your, your arms, you're creating this like energy. And if you're, if your upper body, like your rib cage and your shoulders aren't connected to your, to your hips, you're going to lose all that power. And this might be something that you all have maybe felt, but maybe didn't know what you were working on, or maybe this is something that some um, instructors teach. Cause I'm guessing it's pretty important because if, if I'm, if my, if I'm not strong all through here, then when I pull, I'm gonna lose so much energy because if I'm pulling, I wanna be helping to move my like center of mass forward and my hips and my lower body. And so a lot of that is having strength and stability through your core, which is, a, which is what we mainly think of like our abdominals and our front core. But what's really important is the back. And in the back, we have, um, I'm gonna digress a little bit. We have this, we have, um, another anatomy lesson. We have fascia. I don't know if people have heard of fascia. Um, fascia is essentially like our scaffolding in our body. Um, it's this like sheathing connective tissue that essentially holds our bones, sorry, holds our muscles to our bones and encases all of our muscle bundles. So we have fascia everywhere. Um, they connect our muscles like linearly. So for example, if you thought about your calf muscle, the back of your leg, your hamstring, the back of the leg, um, all your back muscles, they're all separate muscles, but since they run along the same plane, they're all kind of connected through all this connective tissue and this fascia. And so on our back, we have this fascia called thoracolumbar fascia. So that means your, th your thorax, your, sorry, your thoracic spine, it's just like it's named, which is your mid back where your ribs attach and then your lumbar, which is your low back, which is down that attaches to your pelvis. So there's fascia that attaches basically your rib cage to your pelvis and it's in, it's in the back of your body. And so you can strengthen that fascia and, and create, cause they, cause fascia has tension and you can stretch it and almost like strengthen it by working the muscles that are connected along their path. So thoracolumbar fascia is um, connects is connected. It's a it's a diagonal across our back, and it essentially attaches our um, like I don't know if you can. See. So you have you have your glute on one side. I don't know if you can see my bum. Your glute on one side, and then your lat on the other side. So it's this diagonal, and then you have a lat coming down, and your glute. So if you are pulling, especially doing like a reciprocal pulling. Anytime you're pushing down with one arm, you're probably pushing with the other glute. And so if you can have that be strong through exercise outside of, um, outside of skiing, maybe beforehand or during your season, just to keep it up, doing exercises that really highlight those, that muscle pattern will help create this much more um, kind of rigid, well, I guess rigid is the right word, but more effective connection of your, your ribs to your pelvis. Your anterior core is great too. We often talk about like when we're pulling or um, I do more backcountry skiing than Nordic skiing, but when we get into like a um, tenuous position when we're skinning on like an icy, icy hill, you end up kind of using all of your whole, like you're, you, we get called getting gripped. And like, I find I use my core so I can like hold myself in place. So you're, you're going to use your front core too, because that's connecting your, your upper body to your lower body, but you need to have that connection, especially in the back. And so that's just a concept that I think is really interesting. And, and if you can like think about that, then it'll make more sense when maybe when you're out skiing, but then also when you're doing some exercises. And if, and if everything's strong and your whole, like when you pull and, it, and your whole body is like working as one object, you're going to be able to harness that power and energy from your pulling and you're going to be able to be more efficient. And it, you might feel like you can do more by working less. Whereas if there was no connection and you're pulling, you're going to lose that connection. You're going to lose all that energy. So we'll talk about some of the exercises, but like probably the most classic one that many people have done because it's often done in yoga and other exercises like a bird dog. 
Um, and it's because it's getting that that diagonal line. Um, and I'll show you a variation of that tonight. So I think, I don't know, I, I would, for some reason that topic of the whole piece gets me really excited because it, um, it kind of explains how our body works and how you can specifically tap into a kind of a different tissue that we don't, that we often talk about, which connects our muscles. So back exercises are great for that thoracolumbar fascia. Um, and then just our abdominals, our deep, deep core muscle, um, the transverse abdominus is, the, is our stabilizer for our core. And it acts sort of like a corset and cinches everything in which is important because that attaches to your pelvis and your ribs. So that's going to give some stability there. And then also your oblique muscles. They're the ones that control rotation when um, we're moving our body. And when you're, when you're pulling reciprocally, you are getting rotation through the trunk and you want to have good stability um, when you're doing that, not just um, being strong in the rotation, but almost like controlling the momentum forward. So those are the other key core muscles that, that you should be tapping into. And so any kind of rotation core exercise is great for that. I'm gonna show you one, show you one later. So that sort of breaks down the um, classic movement patterns and the important joints that you wanna have good mobility in. Um, often with the shoulders, when you're doing any kind of exercise where you're pulling down, you always want to think about having your shoulders like down away from your ears versus rolled forward because you're just going to be stronger there. Um, but overall, it's, it's, I don't know, I don't, again, I haven't done much classic, to be honest. I have backcountry Nordic, so I've done those with, with the edges, like the, um, I think I have a pair of S-bounds, and we just go off-road on those. So similar kind of pulling pattern. And it often makes me think of running. So I don't know why that's compare it to that. All right. So for skating, pretty similar. The whole upper, the thoracolumbar and, and shoulder concept is the same. Um, that doesn't go away. You're still, you know, trying to use your arms to propel yourself forward, which is um, important so that it's not all on your legs. Um, and then with the, with the hips, it's actually doing something great you're doing this like lateral kickback, right? And that's gonna actually engage a lot of those deep hip stabilizing muscles. I have a friend who runs a lot, who is usually sort of injured at the end of her running season. And she always says, oh, it's fine because I'll start skate skiing and everything will go, <laughs> all my like core and back pain will go away because she's actually doing this like skating pattern where if you're using the right muscles and you're, and you're able to keep your core pretty stable and isolate kicking back, it, it becomes a really um, good stabilizer for your pelvis and, and your low back. Um, so that skating motion is important, but I think the one thing that can maybe lead to maybe some like knee pain um, or issues in the feet is because you are pushing at an angle, you might see sometimes, or you're, you might, this might happen to you, or you might see other people where they're knee will sort of like rotate in as they push out just because of the angle out. And that's just gonna put a little um, like torsion and tension through the knee. And sometimes you can get just like, um, with, it's a, it happens in running too. Um, we call it patella femoral syndrome, but it's, it's kind of this like, you know, it doesn't swell, it doesn't really point tender, but it hurts to go up and down stairs. And usually that's, it's like a rotational mechanical stress there. And often if you just work on, again, glutes, cause it's gonna keep me stabilize your femur, um, that can help. And then also through the foot, since you're towing off off the edge of your foot, you're gonna have a little more like internal rotation through your, your foot and ankle. And that can put like rotational um, stress through the feet. And I'm guessing that might be when people get some like plantar fascia, some issues, but. Either way, very similar from the core up. It's just slightly different through the legs down. Um, and, you know, I know some people have sometimes have trouble towing off just because of toe pain. Um, but I'm gonna look at a couple questions. Ellen, yes, it is being recorded. Um, the last two times I've given presentations on Zoom, I forgot to record, so 
that was on my to-do list. Um, just because I'm going to get into a new topic. So I'll go over this real quick. Um, hamstring shortening contributes to back pain. Yeah, definitely. Um, because the hamstring attaches to your pelvis. And so it'll, it can impact your pelvic rotation and maybe just on one side. And then that's gonna, that can affect the sacrum and that can go up the chain. It can also make your back wanna like flatten more. So definitely connected um, and hamstring shortening can definitely do that. And then Sue is asking shin pain, feet pain, skating, that's me. Cause every time I skate each year, my feet cramp. Um, I think it's just part of it is like a completely new, um, movement pattern, new volume. So some of it is just, it's, it's a new stress on muscles that you haven't like trained for. Um, I think making sure you have good ankle mobility and then, um, mobility in your calf, I think will help strong feet will definitely help. Um, the shin pain, it's, it's hard to recreate. Um, unless you did like toe raises. So I've never, um, I'm not sure I can look into that, but I think part of that is just, it's a whole new stress, new stressors. Um, but I think if they have strong feet and good mobility in the lower leg, that should help that. Um, anyway, so that was a quick distraction to the questions. All right, so another big important piece is, is balance. Um, and again, I speak to this mainly from skate skiing because I know every time I go skiing at some point, I fall, I get onto my ski and I fall over the outside edge and I can never recover. Um, and so, and then I always, I watch Jessie Diggins on her Instagram and I feel like she's always doing these insane but amazing balance like exercises. And so, you know, balance is really important too. And it's that glide. Um, which I always hear people talking about, especially with skating, like, can you, you know, stay on that ski and glide? Um, and, and so any kind of balance exercise is excellent for that. Single leg balance, you can get creative, but that's definitely an aspect to work on. And, and balance takes strength and some coordination and just, and just practice. Um, and so that's a pretty easy one to, to work on. Um, so, Someone's asking about hip flexors. I'm gonna get on that at the very end because I've got two really good ones that I learned this summer. Um, if you sit a lot, which we all are doing more of now, I think, since we're all at home more. And then if you try and go out and do things like Nordic ski or run. So I have that, I'll get to that at the very end. Um, knee weakness after falling and getting up in deep snow. Yeah, that's really hard. We were, um, we were skinning up into the bottom of the bowl today in tux and we were wall we were like wall we got stuck in this like deep powder where it hadn't had the wind and i couldn't we couldn't get up um and so with the nordic backcountry it's hard like i often take my ski off to get up to be honest but then you can you know post hole into the snow um i think if you can get into like a like a half kneeling position so one foot is behind you with your heel up and then your other foot's in front in the ski and stand up that way. Um, but getting up out of powder is something that I um, don't know how to do um, very gracefully. <laughs> I don't have any good tips for that. Um, tree, something to stand on. It's hard, it's really hard. Um, sometimes you can use your pole sideways as like just a bigger surface area. Um, but it can put some stress on the knees for sure. So, um, all right. Anyway, so I wanna get into some exercises, which is, might be why you're all here, but I wanted to explain why the exercises are important. And so, you know, it is December. And so I don't know if people have been doing any kind of like conditioning program, um, or if you have your, you know, you know, every fall you start doing your lunges and your heel raises and things, but it's not too late at all. And I think um, what's becoming a little more, not trendy, but I think people are talking about it more and a really valuable piece is um, like in season sort of like maintenance. And I like, and the way that to think about this is basically, especially with classic skiing, if you're going out there and you're doing this motion 
over and over and over and over again, you're, you're really only working in one plane of motion. And we call this the sagittal plane. So you're moving this way. So your muscles that are in your frontal plane or lateral plane, or the muscles that are in your um, transverse plane, which is rotation, all, often aren't getting um, worked as much as the muscles in this plane. And so it can, that is what can create imbalances. You see this a lot in um, runners, more definitely runners who run on the road, um, bikers, people who do a sport that's like literally just like in one plane. And so, like I said, that creates imbalances. And when you have an imbalance in maybe mobility or muscles, that's when you start to often be more susceptible to some sort of like overuse niggling injury. Um, and so I recommend, and it, it takes a little bit of practice and everyone can kind of do this however they want, but, um, what's worked really well with, I keep referring back to running, but it's sort of a similar, um, activity. Um, if you come, if you go ski and once you get home, all you have to do is set a timer for like 10 to 15 minutes. It doesn't take much. But what you should do is think about doing exercises that target the, the other plane than what you just did. So, and I'll, and I'll talk about it when I go through the exercises tonight, but like from here on out, if you've got your favorite, if you do go home and do something and say you go do that tomorrow after you go skiing, when you do those exercises, think about what they are. So like if you're doing something where you're moving sideways, then think, okay, I'm moving in, I'm moving in this plane, I'm moving sideways. And then maybe if you're like, Ooh, I feel, you know, think about what muscle you're feeling. And that's the awareness piece that I think is really important from kind of building your, um, self-awareness from the bot bottom up, right? Like anything you're doing, like think, take a minute and kind of tune into yourself and be like, Oh, my core is like my front abdominals are like dying right now. Right. Okay. So it's probably, you know, core exercise or your lateral butt muscles, you know, you're probably doing some sort of glute meat or rotational exercise, but just even thinking about it and having that awareness is so important because then maybe you'll be out skiing and you're like, Oh, I feel that muscle again. And that's, um, that's what I think. That's the stuff. That's the area that I get really excited as a PT and an athlete and that's when I think it makes a bigger impact than just saying like, do 20 lunges, do 20 squats, um, and, that, and then you're gonna be fine, right? You have to really kind of understand the why behind you're doing these exercises, and then they might help you um, down the road. Or just, or just be able to maintain, or if something starts to feel funny, you'll maybe get ahead of it before you get hurt, before you get to have to go in and stop and go through the whole like, system to get to PT in the end. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's um, my advice for strength. And I, like I said earlier, I'm not gonna do kind of the classics. These are a little bit different and I think they're kind of fun. So the first one we're gonna go over is I call, it's lateral bounding with a slide. <clears throat> and so this is gonna get your lateral hip muscles. It's gonna strengthen your lateral foot. It's, it's powerful and it's quick. And Nordic skiing is like pretty quick, right? So you wanna train your muscles in that same tempo. If you always did all your exercises really slow, you're not recreating what you're doing when you're skiing. And this one also is gonna get your adductor muscles, your groin muscles, which get a lot of work when you're um, skiing, especially when you're trying to glide on one, on one ski. Um, that's when your body will start to tap into all of your um, all of your muscles in your leg and your groin. Again, I know my groin gets a little sore after I know I ski. So anyway, um, I think I had this set up earlier so that you can see what I'm doing. Hopefully you can hear me, but what it is, is you're doing a, um, your lateral bounding, you're landing and then you're sliding your foot over and try and keep your foot flat. So you have enough friction that it stays flat and it doesn't roll up. So you bound and you slide. You can go any pace you want, but the lateral push off is lateral glute and you're sliding. So I call that lateral bounding and sliding. And then the next one is gonna work your calf muscles and it's good for your foot. 
and um, really good foot strength and Achilles. And so it's a heel raise with a bicep curl. Um, question, sliding in. So you, you jump and then you, you slide that foot over. So I recommend doing it in bare feet. So the next one is, um, I use five pound weights. You can use any weight you want. I wouldn't go super heavy. And I think you can see, I'm tiny on that screen. I think you can see my feet. But what you're gonna do is, you're gonna do a small heel raise. And at the same time, you're gonna do a bicep curl. So this probably looks kind of like double pulling. Um, and you're just gonna go kind of like quick. And I'm trying to keep my body from like moving too much. I'm trying to keep it nice and strong. So you're just doing this kind of like quick bicep exercise. So that's heel raise with bicep curl. Um, the next one is if you have a band, you're gonna put it around your ankles and you're gonna do um, a reverse skater. And so I'll show it sideways first, but what you're doing is you're you're kicking back and diagonal. So basically what you're doing when you're skating, right? You're like kicking back. You wanna keep your upper body and trunk really quiet and just isolate the hip extension. Often people will do this and you wanna stay up. And I usually just walk around the room going backwards for, I don't know, like 30 seconds and you'll feel it a lot in the bum. So that's a reverse skater. The next one is a bird dog, which a lot of people have probably done. This is gonna get that thoracolumbar fascia that I talked about. And it might be easier if I do this one on the ground. Um, so this is a bird dog with pulse. So you're doing like a pulsing motion. So you're gonna get into your hands and knees and then a bird dog, if you don't know what it is, is hands and knees, and then you alternate your one arm and one leg going back. So you're getting that nice cross muscle activation, and you wanna keep your core on. Oh, we have a visitor. You wanna keep your core on so that, so that you're not getting a lot of extension through your back, which is what can happen when you kick, um, when you kick back when you're Nordic skiing, like I talked about a minute ago. I don't need this, sorry. So when you're kicking back and you're skiing, I talked about not wanting to extend the spine. So you wanna think about that here. You wanna keep it nice and level. And the pulse is when you kick back and then you like pulse here. Maybe you do 10 in a row and then down. And then you pulse arm and leg. Sometimes for, for a coordination challenge, I'll pulse, I'll try and go arm, leg, arm, leg, arm, leg. And that's getting that thoracolumbar fascia, which is um, really great for connecting that upper body to the lower body. I'm just gonna grab my notes. Um, next one is kind of a, I don't know why I'm gonna say it's funny, but um, a little bit different. And again, it's getting the same muscle group you have to have some kind of like band that's a long band that you can put around something. And you're gonna get onto your stomach. I don't think squall, that's my dog squall. I don't know, I don't think he's in the way. You're gonna get on your stomach. You're gonna tighten your low belly. And then you're either gonna, you're gonna pull your arms down and then you're gonna do like a flutter kick with your legs. And that's gonna turn on that low back and you're also engaging your arms. The other one is you keep your legs quiet and then you just alternate your arms with the band. And it's getting all of that really good back fascia. And um, you just wanna make sure you turn on your lower abdominal because that's gonna protect your back. And then the other one that's on the ground is a Russian twist. And this one, you want to be a little careful about with rotating, but you get into this position, tighten your low belly, and then you can either hold the weight or no weight, 
and I like to go slow. Like maybe just hold, hold on one side. Or if you're comfortable, you can go a little bit quicker. And I'll often like pretend I'm holding a ball, put a little energy between my hands, and back and forth, but really nice and easy. And those, that's getting those obliques, which you want when you're, which you want to have um, be strong to create rotation, but also put the brakes on when you're rotating. And a plank exercise that I like is called, I just call it just a plank with reach. And you're gonna get, if, you're, if you are a planker, you're gonna get onto a tall plank with your feet wide, and you're gonna reach one arm out in front of you like this. And that's, since you're going from a four point position to a three point position, you're having to have like rotational strength. So that's really good there. Um, and then this last one, I've just been basically sharing with everyone this summer who is a um, bipedal, person. Um, it's called the two toe heel raise. And what it does is it strengthens the calf, that first toe, big, that first flexor on the big toe, as well as um, it, it engages your plantar fascia. So what you need, and it's pretty challenging, is you need a step. So I'm going to put this, I have a step right here. I think this should work. You might only be able to see my feet. But that's okay. So you're gonna find basically the edge of any kind of, of any stair in your house. You can hang on and you're gonna get onto the edge of the step. And what I'm doing is I'm putting my two toes on the step and my three littler toes off the step. And my heel is bifurcating the step. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go on one leg and I'm gonna do a heel raise. You can put your other foot down for assist if you want. But what you're doing is you're promoting the toe off from your big toe, which is what you want when you're pushing off on your big toe and you're skiing. And it works your outer calf muscle really well, which is really important to help with foot mechanics. So that's called the two toe heel raise. It's kind of funky, um, but it definitely is excellent for creating good foot mechanics when you're um, sport skiing. So those are the, oh, and then any kind of balance exercise is great. So with those, you can think about which muscles are um, working and then that's going to kind of give you an idea of what kind of exercise it is. So those are a few, like I would maybe do, um, out of that list I just gave you, I would maybe pick like four of them and do that, or five of them as my post work, my post exercise workout. Really quick, but you're turning on those muscles that are different than the ones that you're getting when you're skiing. Um, and then main mobility importance are ankle flexion, hip extension, and like just some good spinal rotation. Um, this one goes out to, and then I want to talk about last night, um, Nate Harvey came into the ski, the white shop and he had a great idea, something that I haven't been thinking about that much, but he was reminding me that this year there, the most lodges are going to be closed. So most people are going to be driving to Nordic skiing, getting out of the car and then going Nordic skiing. So it depends on how great your heat seaters are in your car. You're probably going to be a little stiff and cold. So he was saying, what would be great? Um, like a little parking lot warm up you could do to get warm to ski. And that's important because it's gonna get the blood flow going, loosen up your muscles. And if you turn muscles on specifically, then they're gonna be more likely to fire um, in the next, you know, next time you're in the next few minutes. Like it's like a neuromuscular kind of Kickstarter. Um, you might see, I don't know if Nordic skiers do it, but you'll see some athletes before their race doing all these kind of the calisthenics before they go because what they're trying to do is stimulate their nervous system and um, get their muscles kind of um, reactive and ready to fire. So I was thinking about that this morning and I was thinking easy things would be like, you could do a few heel raises, you could do 
really like just like hopping, like almost pretend you have a jump rope, but you don't just kind of jump up and down a few times. Um, you could do just a couple lunges, maybe some air squats just to turn on those big muscles. And you can maybe you only have to do like five to 10 of them. You don't have to do that many of them. Um, but just to sort of get the, the blood pumping, I was thinking like arm swings, get the arms moving any kind you want there um, and start to fire up your muscles. So if you have any favorites, definitely um, do those. You don't have to do those specifically, but just, just basically get moving and then you might feel better when you hit the, hit the snow. And so I'm gonna tell something, I'm gonna finish up with the hip flexor. So this is just kind of a COVID, hot COVID topic. So many people are having issues with um, all different presentations, but from sitting a lot. And a lot of that has to do with your having a tight hip flexor, which is also your, it's called the psoas. And it's a muscle that goes deep through your pelvis and attaches to your lumbar spine. So it has a ton of, um, it can create many issues, especially with the low back. And so I learned two um, motions this summer that work to like relax the hip flexor. It's a muscle that often gets like tonic, which means it turns on and stays on. And then it, it feels tight, but I don't know about you, but I've had so as is where I will stretch it every day. Feels good for maybe an hour, but then it comes back, right? So it's not like fixing it. And so anyone I know who is any kind of really does anything more than just walking around, who sits for their job, I've been sharing it with them, and it's actually I'm getting really good feedback. So the first one you would do in standing, very simple. Um, what you would do is you stand on one leg. Let me fix this. I think. You stand on one leg, you can hang on for balance. You bend your one knee. So I'm bending my knee so that my, my thighs are parallel, my leg is not forward. So it's like that. And then you externally rotate your hip so it looks like my other, my foot's kind of going behind me. And I've been telling people to do like 15 of these, like before you sit down and then after you sit down, if you sit down for work. So like a couple times a day, super simple. It won't feel like you're really doing anything in terms of like stretch or um, strengthening, but it can help to unlock the hip flexor. So this is for people who have tight hip flexors who haven't found relief with just stretching. Um, and if stretching isn't working, then it's probably something else. And since the psoas are tonic, often with the rotation I talked about with the obliques, if you've got a lot of like kind of uncontrolled trunk rotation, your psoas is often get asked to turn on to help when that's not their job. And so that's another kind of request from your body to use them. And it's another reason why they get really tight. So that's why being strong with rotation exercises can help reduce the overworking of the psoas, if that makes sense. I don't know. So I have another animal that's about to go for the screen. That's Pika, my cat. Um, okay, so you're gonna lie on your back. You're gonna bend one knee and then you're gonna let it drop out to the side while you straighten it out. So I'm sliding my foot up, I don't know, let's see you. Sliding my foot up really relaxed. And then I'm letting my knee drop out to the side while I straighten it out. Again, shouldn't feel like anything's really happening. And I usually say do 10 of those each side, a couple times a day, just to start out. So that's been, I think, a pretty successful um, hip flexor fix that is really getting a lot of people with all of the at home working and sitting that we've been experiencing over the last, how long has it been now? Like nine months. So that was a total side note, but I think important because you need to have hip extension when you're Nordic skiing or else that can cause some low back pain. All right, so that's everything that I wanted to go through. Um, I am gonna, I'm not great at this, but I'm gonna plug myself. Um, I am a physical therapist and my, now you all have my email address, but my, um, my email is, or my website is hillarymccloy.com. 
And I do have, um, I run a um, ski conditioning class in the fall called Powder Hour, it's online. And there's an uphill version that has some of these actually you've seen that work um, similar pulling exercises and then climbing exercises and then your downhill skiing muscles. And then in the spring, I do one called Run Strong and that will probably start in March, it's online. And it's basically prepping all the muscles that you need to be able to run and not get all the imbalance weaknesses and a lot of education as well. Um, and they're all online. They're sort of self-guided. You have videos of me explaining all the exercises and um, they're pretty fun. So I have those classes. And then otherwise I operate as a normal PT place and you don't have to be coming in for a sports issue, but really anything. And that's it. It's eight o'clock on the dot. Perfect. Um, anyone, I mean, Often I'll finish these and I'll be like, wow, I don't know if that was too technical, but I feel like that's what people need, right? Because they don't, um, we don't often hear that piece of it. And so if you have any questions, email me. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks for coming. This was fun. Thank you very much, Hillary. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I look forward to trying out these exercises. It's great. Yeah. So hopefully it was informative and maybe I'll do like a follow up at the end of the year and I'll tell you all the things I learned and how I would have explained some things differently. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, um, we look forward to the recording. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It was great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Hillary, just great. Cool. Thank you. It's a little different than I feel like normal. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank uh -huh. you. Where's coming from? Thank you. Great. Much appreciated. Thanks. Thank you. Let's see, I'm trying to see who I know in here. You're all. You're. You. Keep, everyone. As once someone leaves, they all move. So I can't see everybody. <laughs> but anyway, that was fun, and I'll see you guys all out on the snow. I'm gonna end this. Okay, so I'm gonna stop recording. Yes, after stopping, receive an email. Good, okay.